I'm Dr. John Ewing, the yard veterinarian at the National Western Stock Show. Okay, now somebody might say a yard veterinarian needs to be there because the animals might get sick or because the people might get sick or somebody might, might run amok, but are there multiple reasons why a vet might be here? Well, first of all, just making sure that the paperwork of the incoming animals from out of state are proper. And then the other thing is on sale animals, we have to make sure that the, the paperwork is transferred so that they can legally go to wherever the buyer is going to take them. You're telling me you came here to do paperwork? Do a lot of paperwork. <laughs> it's, all, it's like all of life, you know, 10% fun and 90% paperwork. <laughs> <laughs> but, but that's actually a really important thing because the paperwork is, is a big component of what goes on here. There's a sale and transfer of animals. How do you document that? Well, that and keeping track of animals as they move in case there's some disease problems or things that crop up. And so you've got to have when they've been tested for what diseases, where they're going, and all that information is put together if there's an outbreak of something so that they can track it. So a lot of it is just basically disease, potential disease control. Yeah, and that's a fact of nature. I mean, that's, that happens all We've got the avian flu running around now, but it's harder to contain that because wild birds get it. Oh, yeah. So with something like this, you know, when you have animals that have hooves on the ground, it still does happen. It's I want to say a little easier to contain, but that's a, that's a bad well, word, right? Once you have the information as to the potential carriers for a disease, then you can, you've got a bigger lever to deal with stopping the problem. And it's important, and, and different states have different requirements, so you have to judge each state and what they require in health papers. So it's not a federal thing. It's individual states have their own sort of plan as far as how they test for diseases and what diseases they test for. So you actually have to know the different states and what they require? Mm -hmm. yeah, that's uh, <clears throat> that's <laughs> oh, what wow. this little book State animal health officials. You got the names and the whole names of the whole thing. Any, anything that you want done, you have to call them up and see what they require. In certain states, require some things, and they don't require others, and it just depends. Well, this is a. It's a hugely important. It's not terribly romantic sounding, but it's a hugely important thing because you're not only buying an animal here, you're taking it home to maybe improve your herd or your flock, and you don't want to bring them something you that You don't want to bring bad. something that you really don't want. Yes, and that can just happen in a minute. Well, it, it can happen if the testing isn't done and if the proper paperwork isn't done. So it's, for everything I go out to treat that's sick or is having a problem or whatever, I probably do a hundred uh, health papers for animals going out, you know, healthy animals going to different states. Yeah, in in this country, we have you know we we have uh, human diseases, and we know there's pandemics, and then everybody gets panicky. But people don't really think about the animal thing. Unless you're in agriculture, you don't really think about that unless the cost of eggs goes up a dollar a dozen, right? Mm -hmm. Or you can't get chicken. But you look at somewhere like Britain where they had bovine cephalitis, right? Mad cow or scrapie or whatever. It greatly impacts. You, you, you could get uh, 
if we were to get a break of foot and mouth disease, which we haven't had in this country for almost 100 years, that would be a very big problem because it would really, the beef and, and even the dairy industries would be in big trouble. Yeah. Yeah, so it's hugely important. So it's it's important, and there are even some of the lesser problems. We need to keep track of them so that they don't get out of hand. Yeah, yeah. I, I'll tell you, I have chickens in my little urban farm zone at home, and we were great until I think five, six years in. We didn't have any pests, no problems at all. And then we had mites one mm -hmm. year, and now they're here to stay. Oh, and yeah. it's a huge impact on my flock. It's, yeah, so. I mean, it's, you know, it's just one of those things that you've got to keep track of it. And if you can't eradicate it, you've got to deal with it to a point where it doesn't cause the problems. Yeah. Okay, so from aside from the paperwork, I know sometimes when there's a transfer of animals or sales, you have to make sure that there's no drugs in the system of the animal. Do you do that too? Do you collect urine samples and test them at all, or how well, does that work? Well, not necessarily because it's not as much of a problem with, especially the animals that come through here, you know, doping animals. One is not a good idea, and two, uh, you get caught. Things are pretty nasty. So now there, there are regulations as far as what you can use, uh, animals for sale. If you have an animal that's going to slaughter, there are certain requirements of anything that it's given that there are times for how long it can take effect. And uh, so you've got a lot of limitations on there and so you want to be very careful. They, they pick that up in a slaughterhouse, they're going to come after you and so. it'll be nasty. Okay, so aside from those things, you are here with mostly in, 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 in this building, in this property, in this region, these are all people that are very familiar with ag and many of them are very self-sufficient and they do their own you know, mm -hmm. worming, they do their own castrating, all that kind of stuff. It's kind of, you learn it from the ground up when you're at that stage. But but you also might have emergencies here. Do you get to do any of that kind of thing? Oh, yeah, well, I've already had a few this, so far this year. Really? And, so what uh, kind of thing might you have on oh, that side? Oh, generally it's, it's fairly simple diseases, although we did have a couple of cases, one of a of a cow that had a dead calf in her and it was a real problem and she ended up going up to Fort Collins the University Colorado State University and unfortunately they weren't able to save her because of the the damage that had been done but for the most part it's just bloats and simple things like that every once in a while you may pull a calf or I've seen that happen and boy mm -hmm. That does not look like a job I would want to have. Mm, yeah, in fact, just finished doing one at midnight last night. <laughs> Did you ever read James Harriet? Yeah, the problem, I, I like <laughs> James Harriet and all that. The problem is, is I would read the first three paragraphs of a chapter, and I could tell you what was going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> and guess what? It did. <laughs> But I keep thinking of that story where he goes up and he has to rearrange the calf and the and the cow and the farmer's standing there saying, nope, nope, do it this way. Nope, what are you doing? Blah, 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 blah. Do you get a lot of that here if you're working on somebody's animals or are they, nope, do no, it for they, me? No, I don't have people do that. I mean, <laughs> just leave me alone and I'll, I'll get it done. And I'm assuming you don't have a farmer's wife pushing beer on you before you do it anyway, so it's probably no, easier. No, no, no. <laughs> People who haven't read that story it's, don't get that day. Uh, <laughs> okay, so what do you get to do for the rest of the show? Let me guess, more and more paperwork and a little bit of paperwork. Yeah, well, we've got one more. We've got the uh, the bison auction coming up, and that's going to be getting the paperwork done for that. And actually, it's going to be pretty hectic because they have to be moving their animals out of here within literally within 24 hours. Ah. Whereas other sales, they had three or four days to, to get the animals loaded up and, and out of here. So it's gonna be pretty 
pretty rapid. Well, not only that, but I, I actually went out to the pens because we, have, we, we haven't covered bison at all, really, in our adventures. Because mm -hmm. for the most part, that was a wild animal more than anything. But in the last couple decades, we, we are farming and ranching. Mm -hmm. And so now that this animal is used in a more domestic domesticated range, we're having to deal with a little bit more of a wildness to our show. Is that correct? Because I was looking at them out here, and boy, they are feisty. They've, you know, over the last, especially the last 30 years, they've done a lot of lot of buffalo work, and uh, they're tough animals. They, they're interesting in the fact that if you put them in an area where they can see, they'll go through a barbed wire fence. But if you put them in an area where you just hang plastic on there and they can't see, they won't go through it. Really? If they can't see it, they won't try it. Is that why the green fencing mm -hmm. stuff is up? That's exactly oh, why the green why. fencing panels are. Is Once those are up, they, right they, they can't see on the other side. They're not going to try and go on the other wow, side. Wow, isn't that interesting from a management perspective? Mm. That's a good thing to know. But they are tough animals. Yeah, And they're low in cholesterol, so... Yeah, it, they, they're really tough. They're, I had one t one time that I was working a bunch of them for export, basically, and the fellow that owned it said, uh, can you do me a favor? He says, I'm going to run this one buffalo heifer in. Can you take care of it for me? And I wasn't sure what he was talking about. Well, he runs her in the chute. And her right front leg is broken, and it's only hanging by the tendons. And he said, "Boy, we got a broken leg here." He said, "Not a whole lot I can do." And he, he said, "Well, don't worry about it. I just want you to cut it off." And so I cut the tendons and sprayed some antiseptic on there, and gave her a shot of penicillin, and he opened up the 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 front of the receptacle there, and she took off at a run, and she ran just as fast on three legs as the other ones did on four legs. You're making this up. No. Really? I mean, I mean seriously, she didn't care if she had a broken leg. So she, this is the sturdy animal if you want something that goes. So that Wow. Was, wow. But all he wanted to do was, you know, get the, the leg was just swinging around, and he <laughs> said, get it off of there, clean it up, put some antiseptic on her, give her some antibiotics, and turn her loose. That's a tough animal. Mm-hmm. Yes, it is. Well, so you've been training for this. Before we go, I know you're busy, and you got a lot of stuff on your schedule here, but you were showing us a picture. You used to play rugby. Oh, yeah. This is the training for the bison. Is that right? <laughs> well, actually, it started out the training for the bison was working with camels in East Africa. Did you really? Yeah, I spent, well, after I got out of my bachelor's degree from CSU, I went to the Peace Corps and went to work at the veterinary school at the University of Nairobi at Kabete. Wow. And I worked in the clinical pathology lab, and that's when I decided, eh, it'd be a kind of cool thing to go to vet school. So when I came back after two years, started in vet school, and... That was it. In, but in the meantime, I had to play rugby because one of the fellows I roomed with was from Wales. And he was a Welsh schoolboy rugby player, which is like the highest level that you can play in Wales. And we had a good team. We were 52-1 and one for two, <laughs> the two years I was there. Won two championships. And the second year, I managed to be an all-East African rugby player at second row. Wow. Wow. Other than that, wasn't much. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay, so I'm just going to ask you, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have Rick fade out for us on this, but I'm going to ask you to list, if you can, all the animals that in your veterinary career you've, you've treated. You want to say a yak or a bison mm. and list them all for me. Well, we started off with the exotics, lots of camels. We used to have a fellow around that had Head camels that he took, he had used at the zoo in New Mexico. Camels, cattle, oh, 
longhorn cattle, uh, pigs, sheep, goats. And in Nairobi? No. In Kenya, basically, we were just, we did deal with some, some wild animals because in, injured, I remember one time working on a, a cheetah, and uh, then I did spend some time working at the Tagoni Research Center for primates, doing TB testing on that, colobus monkeys, and fun things. That, they're not really fun to work with because they are strong and they don't like people. And they hate paperwork. And, but <laughs> just, just about anything that would come down the pike. You had a very interesting life. Mm, well, it, it's always fun to do something different sometimes. I think so. Well, thank you so much for speaking with us.